Good morning and a very warm welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. Allow us to extend a very special welcome and appreciation for the many of you who have traveled from around the world to be with us. My name is Lise Grande. I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace. We were established in 1984 by the US Congress as a public, nonpartisan institution that's dedicated to helping prevent mitigate and resolve violent conflict abroad. The Institute is delighted, we're proud, we're honored to host the Missing Peace Global Symposium on Conflict-Related Violence. This is an extraordinary event. It brings together survivors and victims, policymakers, and practitioners. This is the second Missing Peace Global Symposium. The first was held 10 years ago in 2013 when the Missing Peace Initiative was first launched. At the time, many people viewed conflict-related sexual violence as something that was terrible. It was acknowledged as a weapon of war, but it was also viewed as somehow inevitable, that something was terrible, but it couldn't be stopped. The people who launched the Missing Peace Initiative wanted to change this view. In the decade that has passed since the initiative was launched in 2013, concrete, meaningful progress has been made. The work and the research and the dialogues that have taken place under the auspices of this initiative between practitioners, survivors, and researchers has shown all of us how conflict-related sexual violence can, in fact, not only be prohibited, it can be prevented, and it can be stamped out. The Missing Peace Initiative is based on a really wonderful partnership that includes very special institutions and organizations, including the Peace Research Institute of Oslo, Women in International Security, and the Human Rights Center at Washington University in St. Louis. We have colleagues and friends that are joining us today in Washington from more than 30 countries, and we know that we have many friends and colleagues from many other countries who are joining us online. This shows that this is truly a global initiative. At the top of our shared agenda is a very strong commitment to hold the perpetrators accountable for this crime, and most of all, to improve and expand the care, the support, and the justice for survivors. In support of the Global Symposium, the Institute is hosting a special exhibition right outside of the doors here called Nobody's Listening. The photos and the portraits and the narratives that are part of this exhibit document the genocide of Yazidi communities. And we're very proud that it's here during the symposium so that we can share it with you. We're honored to begin the symposium with keynote remarks from Pramila Patton, who is the United Nations Special Representative on Sexual Violence and Conflict. The Special Representative serves as the United Nations spokesperson and political advocate on conflict-related sexual violence. Special Representative. Thank you, Liz. Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants. We are gathered here at a dire moment for humanity, at a time when one crisis eclipses the next, to ensure that the scourge of conflict-related sexual violence and its survivors are not forgotten. I extend my sincere appreciation to Liz Grande and the United States Institute for Peace for convening this symposium, bringing together scholars, policymakers, civil society representatives, and critically survivors themselves to inform the global search for solutions. I'm pleased to be speaking alongside Gita Rao Gupta, the US ambassador at large for global issues, 
and commend her leadership and steadfast commitment to this cause. Thank you, Gita. As tensions rise, coups erupt, and conflicts rage, this symposium provides space for strategic reflection to take stock of what we know and what is missing from research, policy, and practice. I thank all participants for their engagement, noting that in our collective endeavor to close the knowledge, resource, and implementation gap, we are only as strong as our partnerships. From day one of my tenure as special representative, I have made the survivor-centered approach my top priority. After centuries of suppression and forced silence and misplaced stigma, we must navigate a way forward that is guided by the grand truths of survivors as our moral compass. Indeed, the most recent policy framework issued by the Security Council on conflict-related sexual violence in Resolution 2467 of 2019 marked a turning point in calling for a holistic approach centered on survivors' rights, needs, and wishes that ensures their full and meaningful participation in the decisions that affect their lives. Last week, the Security Council convened its annual debate on uh, women, peace, and security, focused on moving from theory to practice. Yet, this aim is everywhere, imperiled by growing global turbulence. It was noted that more than 600 million women and girls live in conflict-affected countries, where women's rights are under attack, as are the courageous individuals and organizations that defend them. At the same time, the delegations negotiating peace are overwhelmingly, in some cases, exclusively male. We are witnessing the highest number of conflict since the close of the Second World War, with over 110 million people now displaced, marking a grim global milestone. Militarization is on the march, resulting in shrinking civic space, virulent backlash on gender equality, and rising reprisals against human rights defenders and journalists who bring atrocity crimes to the attention of the world. Even as entrenched cycles of violence remain unbroken, new threats emerge. Gender-based harassment and hate speech are surging in the relatively ungoverned digital space. An array of new actors, such as mercenaries and private military and security companies, are complicating attribution and accountability on contemporary battlefields. Climate-driven insecurity and displacement is exacerbating competition over scarce resources, increasing intercommunal violence, including sexual violence, notably in places like Somalia and South Sudan. Moreover, the security umbrella for humanitarian protection and assistance activities is closing, and peacekeeping missions draw down in Mali and the DRC. Against this backdrop, we are compelled to recognize that conflict-related sexual violence is not a niche technical issue that can be addressed in isolation from prevailing geopolitics. Global macro trends are turning the clock further and further back on women's rights and leaving survivors further and further behind. Every new wave of warfare brings with it a rising tide of sexual violence. It is vital to the credibility of the multilateral system that we demonstrate to survivors that international law is not an empty promise and to perpetrators that it is not an empty threat. Yet the attention bandwidth of the international community is limited. As the world turns its gaze to the deplorable violence in Israel and the Gaza Strip, other protracted crises fade from the front page. In relation to the escalating violence in the Middle East since the 7th of October attacks, I have requested UN partners on the ground to remain alert to the risk of sexual violence, which we know is often invisible and chronically underreported. The UN Action Interagency Network, which I chair, facilitates the sharing of UN-sourced and verified information 
as a basis for coordinated advocacy and action. We are aware that disturbing allegations, including forced nudity, have surfaced in the context of abduction and hostage taking. As always, we call for such incidents to be independently investigated with a view to ensuring that survivors have access to specialized services and justice. As always, we call for the parties to abide by international humanitarian and human rights law, which exist to restrain violent excess, even in the midst of war. Currently, there are more than 20 country situations within the remit of my mandate. And in each of these contexts, I use my public advocacy platform and direct diplomatic reach to galvanize action in response to credible UN verified information on incidents, patterns, and trends. For instance, I visited Ukraine as soon as the first reports of sexual violence surfaced last year and returned this March. I heard firsthand the searing accounts of sexual violence perpetrated by Russian soldiers, including as a form of torture to extract confessions and to punish and intimidate both men and women in detention. The ages of the victims range from 4 to 84 years old. When I visited refugee reception centers in Poland and Moldova, I witnessed the vulnerability of women and girls who comprise the vast majority of the nearly 8 million refugees to criminal and trafficking networks. For these predatory actors, the forced exodus was not a tragedy, but an opportunity for exploitation. In Sudan, since the conflict erupted on 15th of April between the Sudanese Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces, sexual violence against displaced and refugee women and girls has dramatically increased. In September, I visited the border area where I met a seven-year-old girl who, after fleeing with her grandmother, was raped in the refugee camp where conditions remain precarious, being overcrowded and under-resourced. Sexual violence remains a prominent feature of the unbroken cycles of violence in Darfur, where women's bodies are on the front lines of the conflict. Young women have been abducted from dormitories and hospitals, shackled and transported in the back of pickup trucks by fighters to be sold in slave markets in northern Darfur. Women and girls have been targeted for rape, gang rape, and abduction on the basis of their ethnicity. Impunity for war crimes in this region since 2003 has emboldened perpetrators, silenced survivors, and undermined prospects for peace. In June, I visited Eastern DRC following alarming reports of a spike in sexual violence due to the resumption of hostilities involving the M23 armed group. Many of the women and girls I met had been recently raped and were visibly traumatized. They stressed the daily risk of sexual violence while undertaking livelihood activities, such as searching for food or collecting wood and water. These women faced an impossible choice between economic subsistence and sexual violence, between their livelihoods and their lives. In this climate of interlinked physical and food insecurity, brothels called Maisons de Tolérance have proliferated in and around the displacement camps with women and girls driven into prostitution by sheer economic desperation. Over the past three years, the war in Tigray, northern Ethiopia, has been one of the deadliest on the planet. Sexual violence, including rape, sexual slavery, mutilation, and forced pregnancy, have been used as tactics of war and terror on a widespread and systematic basis. According to the International Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia, who I met last week, the conflict has left more than 10,000 survivors in desperate need of assistance and redress. Yet. Due to restricted access and official denial, these survivors are left to suffer alone. One of the few bright spots on the horizon is Colombia, 
where historic progress is being made in terms of transitional justice. The Special Jurisdiction for Peace has opened a dedicated case on sexual and gender-based violence, including reproductive violence known as Macro Case 11, following concerted advocacy from women's civil society organizations. In May, during my official visit, I heard from survivors of wartime sexual violence about the transformative power of recognition and reparations. There are also signs <clears throat> of progress in Guinea where a former head of state and 10 senior officials are standing trial before domestic courts for crimes of sexual violence committed as part of the repertoire of political repression used to quash a pro-democracy rally in Conakry in 2009 through the pace of, though the pace of justice has been painfully slow. In Nigeria in 2022, sexual violence was included for the first time ever in an indictment against Boko Haram, contributing to evolving understanding and jurisprudence on sexual violence as a tactic of terrorism. Each year, my office compiles the report of the Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence, which provides a public record for a historically hidden crime. The latest annual report, debated this July at the Security Council, records 2,455 UN verified cases committed in the course of 2022, 94% of them targeting women and girls, 32% affecting children. But we know that for every survivor who comes forward to report, humanitarians in the field estimate that 10 to 20 others are never able to reach a clinic let alone a courtroom. The report includes a list of credibly suspected perpetrators as a basis for targeted action by sanctions regime and accountability mechanisms. The latest report lists 49 implicated states and non-states actors, of which 75% are persistent perpetrators who have remained on the list for several years without taking any remedial or corrective action. And in this regard, women protection advisors are mandated to engage with parties at country level to foster compliance and behavioral change and to convene dedicated monitoring analysis and reporting arrangements as an, an evidence base for action. Yet, despite numerous resolutions calling for their swift deployment, just eight out of 20 focus countries currently have this Front, this critical frontline capacity. The persistence of sexual violence on 21st century battlefields as a tactic of war, torture, terror, and political repression is not due to a lack of normative frameworks or institutional arrangements. It is because existing norms are inadequately enforced and existing institutions are not backed with the requisite level of human and financial resources. Our singular focus must therefore be to bridge the gap between resolutions and realities, between our highest aspirations and operations on the ground. States bear the primary responsibility to protect their citizens, yet conflict decimates the very institutions meant to deliver justice, services, and security. As a contribution to gender responsive security sector reform, my office has recently established a dedicated security sector hub to help bring national security forces into compliance with international standards in line with the joint communique my mandate has signed with a dozen affected countries to date. Today, we know more than ever before about the drivers and dynamics the causes and consequences of wartime sexual violence. To translate these into practical results, my mandate has developed a range of tools to build a skill and will for effective action. These include model legislative provisions and guidance to help harmonize national laws with international standards, guidelines on private sector engagement, and a prevention framework which sets out a two-track approach to constraining sexual violence in the first instance and mitigating its secondary harms such as stigmatization. 
Last year, we also published a special report on women and girls who become pregnant as a result of sexual violence in conflict and children born of such violence, which spans 24 conflict settings from 1990 to the present time. This report sets out a platform of legal, policy and operational recommendations for states and partners to take forward in response to a global protection gap concerning a population that has long been understudied and un underserved. By helping to disseminate and socialize good practices and lessons learned, every expert in this room and online can help to maintain momentum to eradicate and spare succeeding generations from this scourge. Each year that I have served as special representative, the number of states requesting our assistance has increased and the geographical scope of the mandate has expanded. Yet the stark reality is that funding has not kept pace. Our conflict-related sexual violence multi-partner trust fund supports the operational arms of my mandate to implement a range of survivor-centered interventions. This includes my team of experts on the rule of law, which has assisted national authorities to strengthen institutional safeguards against impunity in over a dozen countries. It also includes the UN Action Coordination Network, which has supported more than 50 projects in 17 conflict-affected settings. Settings. Yet the volume of available resources is far from commensurate with the scale of the challenge. We cannot continue to shortchange survivors and those delivering on their behalf. As we look toward the 15-year anniversary of my mandate in 2024, I will continue in my advocacy role to galvanize the international donor and diplomatic community to give this cause the attention and investment it deserves. 15 years is in fact a short time in the history of an atrocity as old and enduring as war itself. In that time, we have written a new norm, drawn a red line, and built a new response architecture. Today, the UN is reaching and supporting thousands of survivors who had once been invisible and inaccessible. Slowly but surely, we are expanding the circle of allies, champions, and stakeholders. Slowly but surely, we, we are expanding the promise of protection. But in the final analysis, this is a matter of political will, and no amount of protection or assistance can substitute for what we are missing, which is peace. A world free from war and sexual violence seems distant, but it is attainable. I thank you all for your partnership and unwavering commitment to this cause as one of the great peace, security, and rule of law challenges of our time. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those of us who are online. My name is Kathleen Keenis and I direct the Women, Peace and Security work here at the Institute of Peace. Thank you so much, SRSG Patton. Those were direct remarks, difficult to hear, but we work in a very difficult field. And this field has been growing with your leadership and the others here today. So I want to thank you, and uh, your charge to us is well taken. We need to build skill and will, but bridge the gap between resolutions and reality. And that is really our mission over the next three days. Thank you. It is now my distinct honor to invite Dr. Gita Rao Gupta to the podium. She is our new ambassador at large for global women's issues at the US Department of State. Dr. Gupta previously served as the executive director of the 3D program for girls and women at the United Nations Foundation. She was also a part of uh, the executive director for the United Nations Children's Fund, otherwise known as UNICEF, 
And of course, we know her very well as president of the International Center for Research on Women here in Washington. The floor is you, yours, Ambassador, and congratulations on your new appointment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you, Lise, for inviting me. And thank you to the US Institute of Peace and all the dedicated partners for convening us here today. And um, thank you, SRSG Patton, for your friendship, for your advocacy, for your strong voice. And thank you to everyone in the audience and those who are watching online for being here and for the work that you do every day to build our collective knowledge inform policy and strengthen programming to prevent and respond to conflict-related sexual violence globally. I couldn't help but think that missing peace aptly describes the world that we live in today. And that's why it is vitally important that we're taking the time over these three days to critically reflect on the last decade of collective efforts, identify remaining gaps and barriers, and examine research and policy implications to be able to make real, tangible progress in addressing conflict-related sexual violence. I don't need to tell anyone in this room that the brutality and prevalence of CRSV has not subsided as we so clearly heard just now from SRSG Patton. It is a scourge on humanity, affecting a diverse range of individuals and communities across countries and conflict situations in every region of the world. Looking back over the past 10 years, it is through innovative partnerships with many of you here today that we have transformed the understanding of CRSV from an inevitable cost of armed conflict to a preventable act of violence. The Missing Peace Scholars Network has been a vital source for building an evidence base of research and data for action on CRSV, and I'm looking forward to upcoming sessions that dive into current research more deeply. Similarly, the powerful testimony and advocacy of survivors has reshaped our understanding of the role CRSV plays in conflict. No longer is CRSV considered a private shame or ancillary spoil of war. We know that CRSV is a key driver of conflict and instability that undermines international law and prospects for peace. It is often a particular feature of conflict in settings with already high rates of gender-based violence. It is why perpetrators commit these terrible acts of violence and why we must prevent them. The agency and courage of survivors to share their experiences has transformed global consciousness. We must now show them and the world the same moral courage to do what it takes to ensure that they can thrive, not just rebuild their lives. And we must always remember that our primary responsibility is to the survivor, to center their voices and their needs in everything we do. Let me share just a few examples and lessons learned from our recent work across survivor services, justice and accountability, and multilateral efforts, where we've seen partnerships with survivors, scholars, practitioners, and like-minded policymakers transform the way we prevent and address CRSV. We know that during conflict, many forms of gender-based violence, including rape and sexual assault, but also domestic violence and intimate partner violence, and forms of human trafficking increase due to the breakdown of the social fabric of communities, services, and norms that protect members of vulnerable populations. It is crucial that in our policy and our programming, we understand the full gender-based violence continuum ensure access to life-saving GBV services for all survivors, promote funding of GBV prevention and response as part of humanitarian assistance, and coordinate our efforts. We've learned through our programming and from our partners that to address the needs of conflict-related sexual violence, a fully functioning gender-based violence response system is critical and that for their own safety, we must avoid deliberately singling out CRSV survivors in terms of service provision. The humanitarian response to GBV 
including CRSV, supports survivors in line with GBV guiding principles through a well-established survivor-centered approach, and we need to support and fund that infrastructure as a global community. I'm proud to share a few examples of how the US government is doing just that. One year ago, the USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and the US Department of State's Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration launched Safe, Safe from the Start Revisioned, building upon 10 years of lessons learned on preventing and responding to GBV in emergencies. This initiative promotes women's leadership, prioritizes support and advocacy for GBV prevention and survivor-centered response programming, and shifts funding, influence, and decision-making power to women and girls within humanitarian response systems. Alongside this effort, the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor has managed the Voices Against Violence initiative for nearly 10 years. This initiative ensures that GBV survivors have better access to services, protection, and justice. We have directly supported more than 4,100 survivors of extreme GBV, including survivors of CRSV, to strengthen existing locally-led documentation efforts and build civil society and survivor coalitions. At the Secretary's Office, of global women's issues, which I am honored to lead. We work across the State Department and the US government to integrate gender equality and equity into our foreign policy. As we all know, there are deep linkages between each of these areas of work, between gender-based violence, including CRSV, humanitarian emergencies, women, peace, and security, conflict and atrocity prevention, international law, and global criminal justice and accountability. By working together with colleagues who advance the US government's efforts in each of these areas, we are striving to build a robust ecosystem within government and successful partnerships outside of government to better prevent and respond to all forms of GBV, including CRSV, and hold perpetrators accountable. The result of one such partnership is a new program that I was proud to announce yesterday at the launch of the updated US strategy and national action plan on women, peace, and security. And some of you may have been there at the launch. Earlier this year, my office awarded $2 million to support survivors of CRSV and other forms of GBV in Ukraine. This project adv uh, advances survivor-centered approaches to justice and accountability by providing survivors and local GBV service providers with a range of capacity building, reintegration, and psychosocial support services needed for individuals and communities to holistically recover and thrive. It also works to enhance the capacities of national authorities and institutions to deliver survivor-centered services and ensure that the needs and perspectives of survivors are meaningfully included in peace and justice processes. Access to comprehensive services and holistic care for survivors is a moral and programmatic prerequisite to justice and accountability processes. This is the first step in breaking the silence and stigma that survivors experience, changing the practices that exacerbate violence and conflict, and securing the justice survivors deserve so they can use their voices as agents of peace, live free from violence, and have access to equal opportunities. Justice, as defined by the survivor, is vital for achieving this goal, as is ensuring that local women-led groups and survivor networks are included across the justice continuum. Achieving justice for victims and survivors, including criminal accountability for perpetrators of CRSV, requires improved documentation efforts that are robust, survivor-centered, and trauma-informed, consent-based, and appropriately linked to GBV response services. Data collection and documentation can only take place where it is safe and when services for survivors are in place. The Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the Department of State is investing an additional $10 million over the next two years in projects that support civil society efforts to investigate and document CRSV to uphold truth and justice for victims and survivors, including integrating best practices like the Murad Code. 
As a complement to this work, the Office of Global Criminal Justice is launching a program that integrates survivor needs into the transitional justice process by providing interim reparative measures to survivors of CRSV and including them in designing community-based projects to provide individual or collective reparative measures. These interventions empower survivors to build their lives and reduce the stigma they face in their communities. And I hope Beth will talk about some of this on the next panel. We must also work together to turn the evidence and data compiled by human rights monitoring mechanisms into action to hold those responsible accountable. We need to better understand what tools to promote accountability also serve to prevent and deter future violence. And we must do this while ensuring that GBV service providers and organizations serving women and girls are not exposed to harm, including retaliation by armed groups, and that they're not cited as sources of CRSV evidence. President Biden's memorandum on promoting accountability for CRSV commits to exercising the full authorities of the US government to advance accountability through the use of legal, policy, diplomatic, and financial tools. Over the last few months, the US government has sanctioned ISIS members, South Sudanese officials, a Syrian-based armed militia, and a Sudanese paramilitary leader, all of whom are connected to CRSV alongside other human rights abuses. Tying US sanctions directly to these acts of violence is a first for the US, and something that we hope other governments will also commit to doing alongside us. A third line of the US effort to turn partnership into action on CRSV has been to elevate CRSV concerns within multilateral forums and partnerships. We proudly support SRSG Patton's office and the vital work that she leads with her team to provide technical support to member states on prevention and response efforts, as well as monitoring, analysis, and reporting mechanisms. In the UN Security Council, we stand alongside a broad group of member states to condemn CRSV and to urge commitment to prevention and accountability. As part of the UK-led International Alliance on Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict, we're working together with more than 20 governments, survivor advocates, and civil society organizations to share knowledge and create opportunities for joint action in the multilateral and global space. In fact, I was just at the first meeting of the Alliance last week in New York alongside SRSG Patton and, um, and, and courageous members of the PSVI Survivor Advisory Group, among others, and I was heartened both by the discussion and the opportunity that the Alliance presents for future partnership and collaboration. We're also leveraging multilateral forums working on atrocity prevention to incorporate CRSV-specific early warning prevention and accountability options into atrocity prevention toolkits. GBV, including CRSV, can be an early warning sign for the onset of further atrocities, and we're working to integrate an inclusive and intersectional lens into atrocity prevention efforts globally. We are constantly striving to pursue prevention, not just response, as an explicit objective within CRSV policy and program implementation. Similarly, we are collaborating with partners to identify upstream approaches to preventing CRSV within fragile and conflict-affected contexts, recognizing that addressing the underlying drivers of gender equality contributes to a reinforcing cycle of prevention and deterrence. Addressing GBV, including CRSV, is an opportunity to break the cycle of conflict and forge a just and sustainable pathway to peace. So as we take the opportunity over the next three days to look at what we have accomplished and what more we must do, we, let me emphasize that we must continue in the spirit of partnership. Let us build upon the commitment and expertise in this room and seize the opportunity to act urgently to expand our research and knowledge base on CRSV prevention and response, to use survivor-centered, trauma-informed, evidence-based approaches to our policy and programmatic work inside and outside of government, and to always keep survivors front and center in everything we do. In conclusion, I must say that um, ultimately to stop CRSV, we have to stop conflicts. I have, as a child growing up in India, been a part of three wars. It's triggering. Nothing was destroyed in my neighborhood. 
Nobody was raped in my neighborhood. But just those air raid sirens, getting up in the middle of the night, sitting in the trenches, with the women in the neighborhood singing. My mother would sing Frank Sinatra songs. The neighbors would sing Bollywood songs, just to calm us down. The drives for blood for the soldiers in the front, the care packages, all those experiences. I was six for the first war, nine for the second, 16 for the third. Before my mother passed, she told me that when I was six and my father was in the Navy and away from home, I said to her, if we are taken as prisoners of war, Ma, don't worry about me. They won't kill me because I know how to wash dishes. <laughs> and I can serve as a servant in one of their households. I share this with you just to say that I watched how that trauma actually begets a cycle of hate and further lays the foundation for conflict. So just keep that in mind, that ultimately, to stop CRSV, we have to stop this vicious cycle. We have to stop it somehow. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And really, thank you for keeping this very real and keeping the understanding of what we will be working on. Because this is work. These three days are about work. And as you've identified, partnership and relationship building. And I've been very privileged over the last decade to have the partners that Lise Grande mentioned Peace Research Institute of Oslo, the University, Washington University at St. Louis, and also the Women in International Security. Along with all of you here today, we intend to make action happen together. So thank you. We're going to transition now to our first panel. And we're going to focus on very much what our keynoters have directed us to, making policy count to end conflict-related sexual violence. We're going to look at the progress and obstacles. And as everyone has noted, this is about breaking down the silos. We are trying to bring all the sectors together to talk with one another, which it's tough sometimes because we work in different languages, even if we might speak the same language. So I'm going to now uh, invite our panelists uh, to the stage, beginning with my co-moderator, Kim Twee Seelinger, who has been an anchor and also a visionary about how to prevent and also how to keep the survivor in our focus. Kim joined the International Criminal Court's Office of the Prosecutor as its first senior coordinator for gender-based crimes and crimes against children. She oversees all policy and casework related to these issues, seeking to bring survivor-centered, trauma-informed approach to all investigations. Her bio is quite lengthy, as her many titles are, but we welcome her to the stage to set the stage uh, at that end, and all of the panelists, Kabasia, Margot, Beth, and Tom Jarai. All right, yeah. Thank you. The floor is yours. All the mics are already being managed up above. 
So just start talking. There might be a minute delay, a second delay. No. Last time uh, we sat here for the first Missing Peace meeting, I didn't need reading glasses. <laughs> it was 10 years ago, so now uh, things have changed. Um, but it's great to see you all. And I feel like I know most of you in this room and am aware of your incredible brilliance and commitment to this issue. And guarantee you, whoever you're sitting next to has given up a full day of putting out fires to be here just as you have. And so really take advantage of, of meeting everyone you can in the room because there's so much brain power and commitment here. So I am Kim and I also teach at Washington University in St. Louis, but I am on leave this year so I can work at the International Criminal Court. And I am so excited to welcome our panelists to, uh, to this first conversation. Um, I think they don't need much introduction, so I'll be very brief. But we have here um, Ms. Margot Wallstrom, who, as many of you know, has, was the first uh, special representative for sexual violence and conflict starting in 2010 and has a long record of civil service uh, in Sweden on women's issues and many other security issues. And she uh, has also, of course, as you see in the bio, served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Sweden. And we're very lucky to have her here guiding this whole event this week. So thank you. For, for coming. Um, next to Ms. Wallstrom is a very beloved friend and housemate even, briefly, uh, Kovasia Hawasu, who many of you know as one of the most sort of just leading voices to keep us um, aware of survivor-centeredness and what it means in all of our work. He is the survivor champion, one of the survivor champions for the UK government's Preventing Sexual Violence Initiative and received his MBE for his incredible efforts um, just a few years ago. So welcome, Kolbasia. Next to Kolbasia, we have Ambassador Beth von Skak, who is our lead. She's our ambassador at large for global criminal justice in the United States government, um, which is, when I heard of the appointment, Beth, I literally stood up and just, I think I shouted. Um, I was so excited because Beth, <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador von Skak is, she's actually a very, Longtime friend and colleague back from California days, and just knowing that you're at the helm for this incredible piece of work and our, our government's face on this gives me such hope. Um, so thank you for, for being here today. And then we have Tondrai Chikua, who I also know from a long time ago. He has been sort of real backbone for the SRSG's office for since its start, actually, and is a real expert on how for example, the Security Council moves and thinks on these issues and has shaped a lot of that movement and thinking himself. So we're grateful for your time too, Tandere. And then my very dear friend, Kathleen, who also needs no introduction. But Kathleen, I thought that what we might do with this incredible panel is just start with an opening question that they can all respond to. And then we'll have some individual questions for you and then a closing question in common. So, and then some audience discussion. So we'll try to keep things moving and ask for concise, maybe three minute remarks. Um, so our first question is, when you think back to when you first started engaging on the issue of conflict-related sexual violence in whatever your role was at the time, what did you not know about it? There may have been many things, but what strikes you as like a real key knowledge gap that you had at the very beginning of your work um, so maybe we can start with you, Margot. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you for the previous uh, speakers' uh, interventions. And of course, uh, a special thanks to Pramila, uh, who is my, one of my successors. Uh, and I know that she and, and her team, they are just doing a tireless work on, on this issue. So thank you, and for laying the ground for, for this discussion. Uh, this is now uh, soon 14 years ago, and uh, I thought I knew something. I thought I could intellectually understand sort of the, what this meant and how many people, how many women were affected by conflict-related sexual violence, and I soon understood how much I did not understand, and I think it was especially meeting all these survivors listening to their stories, understanding slowly that 
this is, makes such a deep imprint on uh, us, of course, a, a person, an individual person, a family, a society, um, a country, uh, and also uh, something that quickly became clear to me that there are so many misconceptions about what this is. And I have kept saying since then, when I describe our mission and, and the task that we have at hand, that is really about those basic three misunderstandings. First of all, that this is inevitable, because it has always been there in every war since beginning of time. Uh, secondly, that it has something to do with sexuality, with sex and that can make it taboo in, in certain uh, sort of cultures or settings, um, and, and not really about power, which, which it is with the sexual expression. It's not the other way around. And the third is that this is a lesser crime. And as you know, this has been even used uh, as a defense, saying, I could have killed her. He says, so this is a lesser crime, but it is not. It lives on. So 20 years after the, when we visited uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, we met with, with women, and they were 20 years after this happened, they were still trembling when they uh, sort of gave their recollection of what they had been through. So, and so I, it's really the meeting the, the survivors and, and listening to, to their stories that we understand what it is that we did not uh, fully uh, take in only by intellectually learning more about this. And I think that has to guide us also, the survivors, exactly as Pramila said, the survivors-centered policy. And, and I would say it changed my whole political life. This made me introduce a feminist foreign policy in Sweden, uh, my experiences from, from this. So that was the background to that. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, Kolbasio, what about you? Hello. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there is, um, I think there's a few things, you know, as, I mean, the first thing for me as a survivor is the backlash that I receive, especially, you know, from uh, family members. And, for example, you know, my uncle, you know, said to me that, don't bring shame on the name of the family. And that was quite, you know, difficult for me because I was thinking that probably, you know, family is going to be um, the solace, you know, the place where I can, you know, find, you know, comfort. And then, you know, I find it how difficult and also lonely, you know, the journey um, is to, um, for healing and, you know, to recovery. And it took me, for me, in order really to uh, to unlock that. And I also want to thank you, um, you know, the Ambassador um, Geta. That I think there is one thing that I think, um, I think we need to embrace, you know, our um, vulnerability. And if we, if we feel it, I think we need to um, allow that. And that's one thing that I also learned. And the one other thing, because I have a few points that, point that I want to kind of highlight quickly. I think the one second thing that also I want to highlight especially for policymakers or for us, is that uh, sexual violence, as is violence and also dehumanizing, you know, as such, it does not define, you know, survivors, right? And uh, that, that's something that, you know, I, I see quite, quite a lot, is um, whatever that experience you have does not define you. And you can see quite a lot of survivors here, um, leaders and, 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 so and, and, and so and so. And I think the other thing that also I think I, um, I learned you know, through, uh, throughout the time, is that, you know, survivors, you know, as such, we are not um, one, one simple group. You know, in that group, there's a complexity, in that group, there's, a, uh, you know, individual uh, within, uh, within that group. And, you know, we need to consider survivors, you know, as an individual. There's no one solution fit all, you know, each um, survivors, they need a uh, different. And also, I, I want to also highlight that when we are thinking about, you know, policy, um, especially, it is not about we as a policymaker, our want. It's all about the survival need. And I think that's really, um, really important. 
um, for us as well to understand. So I think those things that I learned, you know, through my journey of doing advocacy and stuff. And also, I think one thing that I want to highlight as well is I saw so many survivors here in this uh, symposium, you know, today. And I think that's the standard we need to set. Because when we're debating conflict-related sexual violence, one key stakeholder that needs to be part of that conversation are survivors. And at times, you know, we miss that out. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're trying, Kobas. Yeah, we're trying. Thank you for guiding us, um, Ambassador. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to be here on this panel and this conversation. Um, and I really look forward to learning more from all of you about what we can do now that I'm in a policymaking role as the head of the Office of Global Criminal Justice. So I started my career right out of law school at the Office of the Prosecutor of the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. It was a joint prosecutorial office. And it was very much, this was in the late 90s, um, very much a blue sky moment. This was the first time that these crimes had been prosecuted really since Nuremberg. We had a handful of domestic jurisprudence that we could look at, the Klaus Barbie case in France, et cetera, the Demjanjuk case here, but really we were going back to the Nuremberg era. And if you've read those records, you know that sexual violence was virtually invisible there. There are these little euphemistic references in the record, et cetera, but it was not actively charged, it was not pursued, there was not evidence placed into the record. There were some national trials in various occupation courts in the post-World War II period that did look at sexual violence more directly, but very, very rare. And so we were starting with a blank slate here on, on many fronts, but definitely when it came to sexual violence. And the prosecutor at the time had the vision and the foresight to hire Patricia Vizier Sellers, who maybe is too many in, hi Patty, if you are, um, to basically lead the work on conceptualizing how the prosecution was going to approach conflict-related sexual violence and other gender-based violence that happened during both conflicts, the war in the former Yugoslavia and then the genocide in Rwanda. And it was really through her tireless efforts in ensuring that investigators were asking the right questions and were approaching survivors in a sensitive way so as to not re-traumatize them, to ensure that there were women who were integrated into investigatory teams so that women survivors had, and sometimes men survivors, had someone whom they felt comfortable revealing what may be the most... Um, horrible thing that they could ever have conceptualized for themselves. Making sure prosecutors had a theory of the case so that they could charge these crimes and knew what type of evidence would be necessary to establish the responsibility, not only of the direct perpetrators, but also those up the chain of command. And because Patty was in the role that she was in, it had this incredible ripple effect throughout our entire organization. And so we saw the Kunarats case, right, which Charles charged rape as torture, because we had torture listed, and so we could use that as the hook to charge rape. We had the Akayesu case, which was able to establish the precedent that rape and other forms of sexual and gender-based violence could be the predicate acts for genocide, even though the Genocide Convention does not mention sexual violence anywhere in it or gender-based violence anywhere in the treaty. And so she was able to help establish this precedent. That precedent then was able to be picked up by subsequent international and domestic tribunals. It's not legally binding, but it was highly authoritative. So you saw the special court for Sierra Leone building upon that foundation and charging forced marriage as a separate crime. Why? Because the prosecutor spoke to women, and women described a different violation than sexual enslavement or sexual assault. It was the imposition of a status of marriage that would then follow them forward for the rest of their lives. They wanted that to be charged separately. The prosecutor did that, and the appeals chamber ultimately ratified that approach. Then we see that theory being picked up by the ICC, the International Criminal Court, the extraordinary chamber in the courts of Cambodia. Then we have um, the extraordinary African chambers, which prosecuted the crime of uh, sexual violence crimes for the, the Chad era under um, Heath and Habre. That tribunal did not necessarily charge sexual violence at first. What happened was survivors, while they were testifying, suddenly began to speak of what had happened to them on the stand 
spontaneously. And it caused uh, the need to pause and to revisit. And one of the survivors was able to directly identify Hisen Habre himself as her perpetrator. So the lesson that I took from all of this experience is the importance of individual human beings being willing to have the courage to step out of what is a, the one pathway and to pursue a different pathway and to say, wait, I'm going to look for this evidence. I know it's there. I'm not going to be satisfied with these 15 other counts that may be much easier to prove and to investigate. I'm going to go searching for this evidence. I'm going to do so in a way that's careful. I'm not going to get impatient with survivors because they take time to maybe come to uh, a willingness to be able to speak about these issues more publicly. I'm going to do this in a way that is survivor-centered. I'm going to work within communities to be able to surface this experience amongst individuals. And then survivors feeling comfortable to be able to move forward. And that's where you all come in, I think. So many times that we've seen survivors being willing to tell their stories, it's because they have a vast support network behind them. One of my clients, when I was a practicing lawyer, um, and he was describing his experience testifying in court for the first time he was the victim of sexual violence. He described it as rowing a boat, and he was at the front of the canoe. And he described looking backward and knowing that there were other survivors in the canoe with him. He was at the front. He was there on the stand. He was confronting the defendant, who was a former minister of defense of El Salvador. But he knew that he had people behind him rowing with him. And that is you. You are helping to row behind those individuals who are at the front of that boat. And so my big learning is the importance of individual human beings. And that's why this gathering, and thank you so much to the USIP for having this be a signature topic and being able to have the power and the resources and the willingness to convene all of you here. So I really look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, Andrei, what about you then? Well, thank you very much, uh, Kim. It's difficult to follow uh, all of that. Um, but um, I began working on this issue um, in 2010, uh, working on this issue full time uh, when I joined the Office of the Special Representative, um, hired by Margot, in fact. And I'm not sure whether to say thank you uh, for that, um, because the, the reality is that um, once you begin on this issue, you step into a shadow, and it's a shadow that you, that you can never truly step out of. And that's something that you don't know until you are in the trenches of this. Um, by that point, I'd been working for 10 years on the children and armed conflict issue, and we had focused on six grave violations against children, including sexual violence. So I came in with some confidence that I knew something. And as the adage goes, you don't know what you don't know. And I realized that, actually I have to say, I was completely overwhelmed. Uh, Margot was cool, calm, and collected as always focused, but I was completely overwhelmed um, when I started, overwhelmed by the, the sheer magnitude of the silence that shrouds this issue, by the misconceptions, as you mentioned, Margot, the myths, um, the false narratives that made it difficult to get a foothold to begin attacking the problem, that made it difficult even to develop a conceptual and analytical framework to attack the problem. Uh, it took me aback. I was completely overwhelmed. And I also realized that I knew, and maybe I can say we knew at that time, very little about how to structure an operational preventive response. Because what we inherited was many years of work on SGBV. Um, and mostly that work, if I could be fair, um, on the UN side, was on the back end of violations. It was very structured, deep, 
and resourced work on services for those who had already passed through these crimes. But we were very thin on the front end of the violations. And I remember in the office, we often used to say that an analogy that circulated in the office was that it was akin to trying to mop the floor with the tap still running. And we had to begin thinking about how to structure an operational response to turn that tap off, to prevent these crimes from happening in the first place. Um, and we started on a, on a, on a clean, clean page. We're gonna move into just drilling down a little bit more on these really important reflections that you've each helped us set the scene, if you will, because there are people in our audience who are been working on this for decades, and then there are people who are new. So I really appreciate your giving a little bit of your background here. I'm going to turn to uh, Margot at this point. Margot, you talked about just coming to terms with this agenda globally. But I'm curious, what have you been most surprised by with regards to the progress since you were the SRSG for sexual violence in conflict? Is there something that has surprised you that was unexpected in the storyboard? How little we learned, <laughs> is that the short answer? Or, or why, why don't we implement uh, the things, as, as we've heard, the normative framework is, is there by now. We've had, what is it, eight consecutive Security Council resolutions establishing this as a very important point of, of peace and security. But, but looking back at uh, Resolution 1325, it is almost like comparing failures uh, these days. And I get very upset because I can see that when there was a peace deal struck uh, in T Tigray, about Tigray, no women around the table. No women, as, as we've heard also Pramila say, uh, they, are, they are nowhere still. And if, this, if they are not there, this will uh, make it impossible to fight impunity for these types of crimes because they will not be brought up in any peace negotiations. So what is it that, that, that makes it impossible to, to implement? It is almost like with climate change. We have known this for so long, but, uh, but we are still not uh, willing to absorb the truth about what is happening and, and act accordingly. And I think that psychologists need to be involved in all of this, the behavioral scientists instead, to, to explain why, why this has not happened. Uh, but here it's really about insisting on women being there at the negotiating table um, and being involved in, in the processes, uh, also in the Security Council. <clears throat> I, I actually looked at my old notes from, from those, uh, you know, fr from those days and I said it was, um, uh, what worked well was setting, we set a five-point agenda. Um, uh, of course, starting with fighting impunity. Uh, we did the reporting to the Security Council. I think that worked well uh, also. We um, designated sort of five, no, seven um, focus countries um, and clearly to have examples, good examples and, and provide results. The media contacts uh, worked well, the feed, field visits, um, the documents were well written. I had fantastic, a fantastic team, and the joint communiques and things like that. But then it was the struggle with member states uh, in the Security Council trying to put cases on in our reports every year, having to sort of negotiate what should be written there and and what can we not mention. Um, and of course, um, also making sure that this was taken seriously, that, that there, something would happen uh, afterwards. 
And I think that this is uh, still the, pr the problem. There were a number of things that we knew early on that we would need to deal with, but we could not, we did not have the resources when we started, like children born out of rape. And I know that this is something that you have followed up since, and my successors have been following up. And I think this also has a weapon in the hands of terrorists. It's also a kind of new phenomenon, or new and new, but it is uh, something also that that um, uh, more recent uh, teams have had to, to deal with. We were talking about the military. How do we involve the, the military? What about military doctrines and what is written there? How do we make it a, a shame to, to, to do these uh, things? And I think we, we would have liked to, to do more also on, on those. So there were a number of things that we could, early on, we could see were, were necessary. And I think we still have to train prosecutors and judges and make sure that the whole justice system works, uh, works uh, much better. So these are some of the, of the gaps and the understanding of, of this. Um, and how do you change norms and, and change attitudes in society? That's the most difficult, no? Uh, and, and this uh, is one of the reasons why it still looks so, so problematic and so dark. And now we see, of course, a new in the situation for women around the world where uh, oppression is, is uh, clearly uh, going on, like in Afghanistan or, or Iran. But, but everywhere in the world, uh, women's rights are taken from them. And uh, this is what we have to look out for. Thank you. It's back to me, and I have the next question for, um, from Kolbasia, actually. Because in your opening comment, you touched on some of the myths and misconceptions or things that you wish policymakers understood about conflict-related sexual violence. So I'm wondering, did you want to add anything to that or offer advice about how they can meaningfully engage with survivors? I'm thinking of your activism with freedom from torture, the networks that many survivors represent here. If we want policymakers to understand survivors' needs, how can they learn that? Um, what would your advice be? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, th I think when I, um, you know, started, you know, doing advocacy, especially on resource-centered approach, and I think we have really traveled, you know, far um, to the point where uh, where we are, and now, you know, um, so a centered approach became like a case, a case for us case phrase or something, like everybody talking about so uh, centered approach. But there is so much learning that need to be uh, need to be done. And there is so much barrier that, you know, we need to jump on. You know, tomorrow we have a panel on that that we're gonna really elaborate. But um, what I, one or two things that I really want to say is that, and what I also seen used as a barrier is the vulnerability. That, you know, survivors too vulnerable that they cannot engage. I mean, there's no vulnerability that will stop you really know what you need, what are your needs, right? There is no vulnerability that will stop you do that. And all what survivors need is the space and the platform, you know, to engage. Um, in June, uh, my colleague Nadine and also I think Grace here were invited um, by the Red of uh, Mujer and Vic Victimists and professionals. I hope that I did not pronounce it uh, wrong. By you know Angela and her group to go to Colombia, and we went to Colombia. And throughout our time there, we met over 600 survivors, really engaging into the conversation and discussing about policies. And when you know the government, the Colombian government decided about the micro case. I mean, you know, the cheer that was in the room really inspired me how survivors really consistently asking for things that they think that that is the thing that, you know, they, um, they want. And also um, uh, in September, uh, with my, you know, colleague Nadine and also An Angela uh, from Colombia, we went to Guinea. And there we s met about 300 survivors really debating about what they feel 
that need to be done in order to address, you know, the justice or the reparation that, you know, they, they want. So there is, even in the room, how many survivors, you know, leaders that are here? There is so many of us. So we are here, we really want to engage because we have something that we can contribute into the, into, into the discussion. We just need to create a space, you know, for it, um, you, know, you know, to be. And I think also implementation of that, um, and you know, tomorrow you can hear about it as well. Um, Lamp Lifeboat Ladder, which really implemented the sewer centered approach into the, you know, program that they have. You know, for um, you know, for women, you know, care of conflict, sexual violence initiative. I hope that tomorrow you can hear about how you really put in practice the soul-centered approach. Thank you. Thanks, Kobasia. It's one more from me, and it's for you, Ambassador. Um, I think many of the folks in this room aren't yet familiar with the work of your office, um, and so I'm wondering if you could just shed a little bit of light on that, and then. Are there policy priorities that you have with respect to conflict-related sexual violence that you'd like to share with us? Because um, I think people would be very interested in how their work might support the work of, that your team is doing. Yeah, terrific. Thank you so much. So this is an office that was the brainchild of Madeleine Albright when she was Secretary of State. She was very involved in standing up the two ad hoc tribunals that I mentioned in my opening remarks, and she wanted there to be a direct point of contact in the State Department to channel support for those institutions, and she wanted that office to report directly to the Secretary of State. Over the years, and particularly under Secretary Clinton, when she was uh, Secretary of State, our mandate has expanded. And so now we really work along the whole uh, spectrum, let's say, of atrocity situations. So upstream, where mass atrocities are being threatened, where we're starting to see the risk factors, and as been mentioned, we know that sexual violence is one of those risk factors. It's one of the early forms of violence that can emerge, and when impunity sets in, that can often lead to a spiraling and an emergence of different forms of violence that then can result in a full-scale mass atrocity situation. So upstream, we work with our development colleagues, our Human Rights Bureau colleagues, and other colleagues to try and build resiliencies within communities to try and raise the profile and the voices of peacemakers, to try and look at those risk factors and find ways in order to mitigate them, um, working with our embassies and posts and with the diplomatic community in those countries. Then, you know, moving along the continuum when we're in a full-scale conflict or a repressive situation, we're thinking about mitigation, we're thinking about documentation, we're thinking about laying the groundwork for future accountability, um, everything that would be needed to try and bring that situation under control. And then we're often working um, across the State Department uh, uh, and across the interagency system to try and um, surge focused expertise and diplo diplomatic um, measures to try and bring that situation back under control. And then after the fact, we're very much focused on a, a transitional justice approach, looking at all of the pillars of transitional justice. Uh, accountability, of course, being among them, but then also truth-telling, guarantees of non-repetition, the rehabilitation of survivors, reparation, etc. Thinking about lustration, removing individuals from positions of power if they have allegations against them, so that the society can move forward with a new leadership. Um, all of that, and so we work in many of the same countries that um, SRSG Patent mentioned, where we've seen sexual violence happening as part of a broader campaign of mass violence. Um, I deploy a very small programming budget, and so I try and work in partnership with our Human Rights Bureau, with our GWE Bureau, our INL Bureau, which is our Rule of Law Bureau, in order to capacitate either the institutions themselves that are doing the accountability work or critical civil society actors that are part of the system. Ultimately, I think my job is to strengthen the system of international justice globally and to make sure that the United States is a key partner in that system, whether or not we're a member of the relevant institution or whether it's a Security Council initiated project or it's something happening at a very grassroots level. I want this government to be supportive in whatever way that we can. And so we really do think about the system as an ecosystem with many different nodes within it. There are international institutions, there are national courts, there are my counterparts around the world, there are civil society actors, there are very, very local actors, and then there are communities that are directly affected by violence. And so in my programming work, in my diplomatic work, 
I try and look for tools that can strengthen all of those different nodes within the ecosystem. Thank you for that, Ambassador. And uh, I'm going to pick up actually something I'm hearing uh, throughout all of your commentary, and that is uh, this problems of institutionalization. How can the institutions themselves change? Tondurai, you have been at the intersection of the UN Security Council, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, and conflict-related sexual violence. Can you give us a, a view on what is changing that is, can give us a little hope, and what needs to change and how we can help? Well, thank you. Um, well, I would say that the first um, point to make, and maybe it's a, 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 a glimmer of light in the shadow, is that there is, uh, for all of the fractures in the, and deep divisions in the council, there is, a, um, there is a remarkable consensus um, in the council around the CRSV agenda. Um, and I think that consensus has depended largely on a disciplined approach of framing CRSV as a protection issue in the frame of international humanitarian law, as opposed to looking at it as a human rights issue covered by international human rights law. And of course, we understand it as a rights issue, but I think the, the discipline uh, of the IHL frame has been um, incredibly important to, to, to bring everybody on board and generate the consensus. And I think that the, that consensus is exemplified by um, the resolutions. Margot mentioned eight women, peace, and security resolutions. Um, five of them focus specifically on CRSV. Um, six, if you count 2331, which for the first time expressed the intersection of CRSV, uh, trafficking in armed conflict and violent extremism. And what is very clearly understood in the council is that this is a legitimate, legitimate peace and security issue that requires an operational security and justice response. And the last years have been about working out what that operational response uh, should, uh, should look at. And I think it's also encouraging um, the recognition in the council that um, we need a structured framework to enforce compliance. And the resolutions have essentially spelled out the key elements of that structured framework. And I would say maybe there are four in broad outlines. Uh, first of all, the mandating of a global surveillance system, a monitoring, analysis, and reporting system, and understanding that without um, reliable and timely information, there is no basis for action at, at any level, including uh, security action, uh, council action, and, and action at institutional level um, throughout. Um, secondly, uh, the framework engineers a conduit of steady reporting to the Security Council, um, which has also been mentioned, uh, reporting in the name of the Secretary General, with actually what is a remarkable focus on the perpetrators, a mandate for the Secretary General to include a list that for the first time shone the spotlight of international scrutiny on those who are committing the crime. And uh, I find it still remarkable to this day that a member state body like the Security Council would give a mandate for the listing of state and non-state parties. Uh, it's uh, actually re a, re a remarkable victory. Um, um, thirdly, I would say, it's also fair to say that the Council committed and in some ways has lived up to the commitment of using all of its peace and security tools to attack this issue. And that begins by focusing UN peace operations explicitly on CRSV. We can't underestimate how important that has been. 
uh, and a commitment to use sanctions. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned US, uh, uh, US sanctions, which is um, such an important trend-setting development, I would say. But uh, we also can't underestimate how far we have gone in incorporating sanctions for CRSV into the DNA of the Council's work on sanctions through designation criteria on CRSV. And then lastly, and I think that this is probably where the tires hit the tarmac uh, and there is traction and the vehicle moves or not, um, a mandate for the United Nations to engage state and non-state parties uh, for concrete commitments. Uh, and in that process, as we have begun to use those tools, I think we do see that it is possible to gain uh, some tangible uh, protection outcomes on the basis of this more structured operational approach and compliance framework established by the Council. Thank you for uh, deepening our understanding of those. Uh, you have such an insight as being at the front table, so to speak. We're going to shift gears here because uh, we really want this to be a dialogue, and we're going to come back to you for the last round. But right now, we want to open it up to our distinguished group of participants here today with us. And uh, great, I already see hands up, and we're going to take three questions at a time. I see two here. And I see one at the back and one down here. So if our uh, mic runners might uh, write. One there, one there. I saw, yes, right over here. And if you wouldn't mind standing up and just giving us your name and your organization or if you're representing yourself. And I'm going to ask you to keep the comment or question very brief. Thank you so much. And we'll Thank take you. three at a time and then bring it back to you as panelists. My name is Sarah Tamwe from DRC, uh, Goma. Um, if it's possible, I want to speak in French. Uh, I don't know if... We will possible. need an interpreter since we... Uh, do we have the French? Uh, Jennifer, are you here? Yeah, okay, they'll translate. Yes, we, we have a translator or two on the, on the stage here. Okay, thank you. Um, ma question c'est par rapport à la justice. On a un grand problème en RDC par rapport aux violences, c'est d'abord la justice, l'impunité et euh, les phénomènes de filles qui sont exploitées dans les maisons de tolérance, c'est venu avec le conflit. Parfois, il y a aussi des acteurs politiques qui sont à la base de, de ces actes. C'est difficile de, de battre, même pour les acteurs, nous sommes aussi exposés et en insécurité pour défendre le droit de victime. Comment faire pour surmonter ou comment collaborer avec vous à ces niveaux-là pour atteindre une justice efficace et rendre réparation juste pour les victimes, surtout les filles, les petites filles, qui sont victimes, c'est tout un avenir qui est euh, parti. Et c'est le grand travail que nous avons. Comment arriver à contourner ça? Merci. Merci. Okay, Kobasi will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll just translate this for now. Um, our guest, Sara, is from DRC Goma, and she was, her question is about justice. She's asking, I need my glasses to read my own handwriting. <laughs> she was asking about um, this big problem in, in her country of impunity for this crime. And we had mentioned the Maison de, the, the brothels and the sex industry and the exploitation that has arisen in the context of the conflict there. Um, and she's the main problem, of course, is that there are politics behind this conflict which are driving all of these downstream effects, including sexual violence. And so this makes it very hard to address. And so her question is, how can we collaborate with you, with these actors that have power to intervene on behalf of victims and survivors in um, the Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo to reach justice and make sure we have repar reparations for them, including for the very young girls who are affected and this changes their future. Kobasi, how did I do? Ah bon, merci. Ah, hein. 
We'll go to the second question. Thank you. We have that. Please. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Samsetra Alamin. I'm a feast building practitioner from Nigeria. Yes, making policy count. I think before we make policy count, I want to make some observations as barriers to, to making the policy counts. Coming from the a developing country, Nigeria precisely, battling with the Boko Haram insurgency for more than 40, almost 14 years now. This, I think, understanding the context within which this kind of things happen is very, very important, particularly as emphasized by the ambassador at large. Because I'm saying this because our context is are uh, contexts that do not even consider sexual violence as a crime. That is number one. So much so that even policymakers, when drafting the Nigerian counter uh, uh, terrorism strategy and law, sexual violence is completely missing, it's not even mentioned. And then for the extremists who are abducting and then by sexually violating the Boko Haram, uh, women and girls, to them, honestly, women and girls are just created for the pleasure of men. So that there are reasons for abducting women is just a, a strategy for producing future generation of jihadists, not even a crime. So therefore, in such a context, when policymakers are completely blind, and then as the survivors started coming back, and then I started engaging with them and registered up to 2,800 survivors in my small NGO. You know what? I was condemned and abused by the whole society as a woman and grandmother talking about these issues which are a taboo to them. But then I insisted, documented the survivors, gathered their stories, and then went ahead to document the invisible children who were born while their mothers were in captivity and as in detention. Now I have about 800 of such invisible children in our hands. And then for the Nigerian military and security agencies, whenever these women run from Boko Haram or are rescued, they are subjected to go through the same ordeals, if not worse, in the hands of even the state security operators, that many women will tell you Nigerian soldiers are worse than Boko Haram. So these are the contexts we operate. So Ambassador Fleece, as you walk towards policy, in fact, encouraging member states of the United Nations to really come to the reality of the situation, uh, and then empower, particularly, yes, we are, may not say we cannot call on you and to go and then uh, uh, do this for us, but then empower us to please reach out to our policymakers so that they understand the gravity of the situation and then respond appropriately. And then also a societal reorientation, a society that does not see women as anything but just for that pleasure, I think need a serious reorientation to be able to understand the value of women and girls so that, in fact, we can respond appropriately. We really appreciate, in fact, the United Nations leading in this. I was even happy to hear the kind of strategies that are in place towards this, the kind of thing I'm talking, but then we need a scale to scale it up and then reach out to particularly those who are able to engage these survivors, because some of the survivors I am working with, even if you take them to the criminal court, they will say, no, it's okay, we have forgiven them. Because, yes, because they consider it something, maybe a kind of degrading yourself when you say you are a survivor or so. So therefore, we need to work seriously on our societies to be able to bring up these issues prominently so that the globally it is being, as being appreciated in the civilized global world, it is also taken up seriously in our local contexts. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for that passionate plea.
We have one more question, and maybe one more. We'll do all four questions, and then we'll turn it back to the panelists. Thank you. Um, my name is Helene Touquet. I'm connected to the University of Antwerp, and my question sort of connects to the previous questions. In the, in the dialogue, I heard a lot of emphasis on retributive justice. And we all know, I mean, I see the ICC there, uh, global criminal justice, we all know that there are limits to these uh, mechanisms that we have. We also hear that uh, local ju judiciary can be very politicized. You know, there's a lot of obstacles. And I wonder to what extent is there any thinking or is there any place for restorative justice practices within, uh, at the global policy level? Thank you, Helene. And our, our fourth, right here at the front row. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is fantastic uh, panel. I have uh, two short questions. Do you introduce yourself? Sorry. Oh, my name is Wei Wei Nu, and I'm from Burma, Myanmar. I'm currently in, stuck in the US, <laughs> I guess. Um, um, so my first question is around um, Tondara, you talk about um, the concrete actions by the uh, member states or you know generally and when we uh, approach the um, CRSB addressing CRSB it is often easier to talk about uh, providing support for the um, survivors right uh, but it's not easy to talk about ending impunity or bringing justice and accountability especially where I come from in Burma we don't have any local um, mechanisms available. How do we actually, um, what are ways for us to actually push for a concrete actions uh, from the international community when it's come to ending impunity and holding perpetrators of these crimes accountable? Um, and my second question is around providing support uh, to the uh, victims and survivors. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned uh, all the programs that uh, you've been working on um, through your uh, 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 department, um, uh, uh, okay, department, uh, I'm, not, I'm not calling, uh, office, through your office, okay, and, and, and through other uh, offices. Um, I, I'd like to pose this question to all of you, perhaps. Uh, how do you actually ensure these uh, supports are um, channeling to the victims directly. Because often when big, uh, big donors and states and organizations work with the victims, is there's always different intermediary, right? There is a change of organization that work with the victim at the end. How do you ensure to maximize the benefit to the victim? And how do you ensure a direct kind of engagement to the victims group? And, and all these uh, intermediary groups are actually um, having a victim-centered approach and really understanding the context and not actually making harms or making like, how do you af uh, provide effective support, I guess? Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, we were well represented in DRC, Nigeria, I believe, Helene, Europe, and uh, thank you, <laughs> Burma. So um, what I'm going to do, and I'm also uh, the timekeeper of our panel, so uh, we're going to take this fairly, fairly rapidly. Um, Margot, I suggest we begin with you. We'll just go down the the uh, panel here, and you take whatever one of those questions you feel most passionate about or you feel that you can address directly. Thank no, you. thank you very much. I, I'm interested in something that has to do with, with all your interventions and questions here also, and that is, how do we measure results? And I remember us talking about that from the very beginning. How do we measure results in, in this area? Because uh, paradoxically, uh, it could be a very good result if the number of cases increases because then more victims feel that it is worth it to go through all of the pain of, of becoming a witness or a, a survivor of, of this and, and using a, the, the, a, ju a justice a judicial system or going to the, to, to the hospital to report or to go into the police to report. 
But how do we follow up? Because as it is today, we very much measure results in terms of new resolutions and the new sort of uh, structures that we put in place, legislative, legislative and normative structures. But that doesn't say anything about whether we succeed or not. If, do we have more cases or less cases? What exactly has been most effective in, in everything we're doing? I worry a lot about that. And, and there are good examples, and I think we more often should mention those and list those good examples and the, the kind of actions taken. But, but we, we still have to ask ourselves, how, how should we measure results? And, and maybe we have to do that. Of course, your yearly report is a way to describe what is, what is going on. But I think maybe we need to break it down also um, member state-wise or find other ways to sort of both name and shame, but also uh, lift um, sort of the very best examples. And claim, claim the best examples, yeah. Thank you, Margot. How about you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, think, um, I think we need to change, you know, approaches. I think the approach that has been in place is, if it's not 70 years or 75 years, because I think the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights will be 75 years this year or something like that. So I think, you know, the approach has been in place is always about, you know, some group of experts thinking about solution and then providing the solution, right? And I does think that need to need to be look look at it um, uh, intensively, because I mean you know we know uh, you know justice. Even the question of justice, if you ask the two survivors, one person would would talk to you about justice different than the other person, right? And also, if we take a justice, it's a, for example, you know the case of Hussein Abri, you know I'm, I'm from but from Chad. So, how long it took for justice to be provided for, for the survivors? You know, some of them even, you know, passed away in order to get those justice. But it's in meantime, while we're looking for, um, you know, justice that in the court, is there is any other thing that can be put in place in order to satisfy, you know, survivors? You know, there is any type of reparation that can be, you know, can be, can be looked at it. What, what, what are the needs? That's what I earlier on I was saying. It's not about what we want as a policymaker. It's all about what survivor need. I think you know the case of the you know um, um, the lovely lady from Nigeria. I think understanding what is the what is the need of the survivors you know around those. Then what is the solution that can be provided to meet those need? Uh, while we're looking at you know the court, we're looking at you know perpetrators bring him to justice and responding to that. I think the case of uh, Kosovo, for example, understand that the justice through the court is going to take long. So then, um, ad administrative you call it administrative. I'm, I'm a lawyer, yeah. So then, just <laughs> bear with me. Administrative justice was put in place, you know, for 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 survivors. I think you know they get those that you know come forward, they can get. Uh, you know, stepping, uh, monthly stepping, and and so you know to look at the you know to address the you know address address the need. One thing that is really important, yeah, and my friend keeps saying to me that if we are not sitting around the table as the survivors, right, and people debating, it means that we are the menu on the table, and you as a menu on the table, you have no. Figure no say whatever when people deciding what is the menu, so it is really important that we need to change it. So then, when we sit around the table, survivors as well sit around the table. Thank you. Thank you, Kabasia. Oh, thank you. So maybe I'll address Weiwei's very practical question in my sort of new role as a in, in a donor country, um, which was not a role I'd ever occupied before. And the first thing I want to acknowledge is just how profoundly difficult it is to apply for money from the US government. And it's even harder to apply to the EU. So I take a tiny bit of comfort in that, but it's really hard. There are incredibly onerous deadlines, paperwork obligations, monitoring and evaluation requirements, being able to use a website that is impossible to manage sometimes, all of that. Um, and so that is just to acknowledge that it's, it's very difficult. 
But once you get into our family of grantees, we really try and work hard to make this a very successful partnership. So I would encourage people to not give up. We have now, particularly in the Biden-Harris administration, really worked hard across all of the donor offices, including, I'm sure, GWE, to co-create our notice of funding opportunities. So we are not just sitting in our little offices thinking like, oh, it would be good to be funding. No, we are out there in the community tapping into the knowledge and the expertise that exists out there to help design a notice of funding opportunity that is directly responsive to the needs of those communities and the gaps that they're seeing within the larger justice architecture. So part of, you know, the answer is to find ways to plug in and to be connected, whether it's with the local ambassador, the embassy there, um, the USAID member, or reach out to our offices here in Washington. The second thing we have tried to do is to really encourage our grantee applicants to work in consortia. So you're absolutely right. It's much easier for intermediary or multilateral non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations to apply for money. They're adept at doing so. They have in-house staff that can do so. They know how to manage the paperwork. They've done it in the past. So we're now encouraging them to bring in local groups as part of a consortia. So there's a capacity building exercise that happens. And so eventually, those individual smaller groups have the ability, they've seen it done, they've worked through several grant cycles, they can then apply on their own. Um, and we're also asking all of our grantee applicants to describe specifically how they are operating in a survivor-centered and trauma-informed way. Not just having a sentence that says they'll do that, but we want to actually see what concretely are you doing? What staff do you have in-house to be able to ensure you have the expertise to do this work? What experience do you have? What standards are you applying? We're very keen to see the Murad Code and other similar codes of conduct and, and standards um, that have been developed internationally diffused out there into the system. And so we ask applicants to show us that they're able to do that. And so that's some of the ways we're trying to address the issues that you've described, which is responsiveness to survivor communities, but also making the funding available to more local groups. Thank you, Beth. And I would just add, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Marat Code, uh, it is online, and it is um, Nadia Marat, who is the 2018 Co-Nobel Peace Prize winner's work. And so I just wanted to acknowledge it for somebody who might not recognize that important code. And, and the right, you have... And the pen holder for the Murad Code is actually with us, so hopefully you'll meet her at some point. Um, Ingrid Elliott, who's in the back there. Thank you for noting that. Welcome, Ingrid. You are the final word of this panel, Tondra. <laughs> that sounds like a setup. Um, maybe just very briefly, uh, Weber, your question essentially about how do you get justice going? I think one of the lessons we've taken from the last um, 10, 15 years is that just as survivors need support, uh, governments, including those whose uh, forces may be perpetrating these crimes, also need structured support and, and an investment in that support. As Sarish G. Patton mentioned, uh, one of the operational arms of her uh, mandate, a team of experts on the rule of law and sexual violence, which is focused precisely on that. And again, I don't want to paint a rosy picture in shadows, uh, but I recall very clearly your first visit, uh, Margot, to the DRC. And at that moment of your visit, there had been zero prosecutions of FARDC national soldiers. And it felt at that time as if a week couldn't go by without some sort of story about mass rape in the DRC uh, being perpetrated by the National Army. Indeed, indeed. Um, and, you know, through, um, first of all, their acceptance and breaking the silence that this is a problem and a formal agreement that was made with the office. Um, the offices and the UN has invested now a lot in supporting the national justice system, including the military justice system. And there have been now 
um, hundreds, if not several thousand prosecutions of FARDC soldiers. Uh, and this is not to say that sexual violence in the DRC is uh, not still relentless, but I would say, to be fair, we are not hearing weekly news reports about mass rapes by FARDC. And so I think one of the lessons or encouragements that we have drawn from that is that with a structured approach to support member states on the accountability side of things, it is possible to begin changing some attitudes and for messages to be sent that this crime is not cost-free. And secondly, to our Nigerian colleague, I couldn't agree with you more. Contextual analysis matters. And I think an open question and an open challenge is 15 years down the road from uh, the inception of this agenda, we are still struggling to stand up properly the global surveillance system, the monitoring analysis and reporting mechanism um, the council gave us the gift of the mechanism, and then with the other hand said, but use existing resources <laughs> to stand it up. And so I think that there has to be a very serious question, um, empirical research into what it will cost to stand up proper contextual analysis, reporting and monitoring in all of the situations of concern, because without that, we will not be able to design context-specific solutions to this problem. Thank you very much, and I want to thank my co-moderator as well as the panel. I want to acknowledge our keynoters who helped really frame uh, the concerns of the hour. And I want to uh, bring to conclusion this part of our program, our online program, and uh, thank you for watching.